Thanks to everyone who's joining us tonight. Thank you to our honored guests. We're so happy to have you. My name is Molly Martin, and I'm the director of New America Indianapolis. New America is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization. Uh, it's based in DC, but I live here in Indiana. We'll be co-hosting tonight with our partners at the Indianapolis Reporter and of course the Indiana Black Legislative Caucus. Very quickly before we get started, I want to reiterate what Angela said. Please keep in touch with the chat in the Q&A. I will be posting a PDF of some of the statistics about Black economic mobility in Indiana that we're just cycling across the screen. We'll also be taking your questions and comments. If we do not get to your comment or question tonight, we will make sure to reach back to you. We will also be monitoring the conversation on Facebook. Very quickly, I'd like to say that when we hold these conversations that New America and Indianapolis have about the Black community, we always start by saying Black voices are critical to all of our community conversations, to our public problem solving, and to our social lives. Systemic racism and bias impact every aspect of our personal, social, and economic lives, including our individual health. We recognize that Black lives matter. We recognize that race and ethnicity are not the same. And we recognize that the Black community is not a monolith. With those principles and ground rules set out, I'd like to hand it over to the chair of the Indiana Black Legislative Caucus, Representative, Rob, Representative Robin Shackelford, to kick us off. Representative Shackelford, I think you're still muted. I'm sorry, we just went through this. <laughs> Thank you, Molly. Thank you, everyone, uh, for attending. I just wanted to go over and welcome everybody. I want to make sure everyone know the purpose of our town halls. This is our fifth year conducting the town halls. There is two foes. We try to make sure that we come out to our constituents personally and let them know what was some of that important legislation that was passed during this last session. And we wanna get ideas and your feedback for next legislative session. So this is a great time and opportunity that we can get this done. I am gonna introduce our IBLC members who are here with us today and those who couldn't join us today. I feel it's very important that I go over our leadership positions. Why? Because when you're in a leadership position, you're at the table, you're there making those decisions when they happen. All of our legislative members are in leadership roles. And so you'll know who you need to reach out to, what our members' expertise is. So going in alphabetical order, the members that are present today, we have Representative John Bartlett. He is our IBLC parliamentarian, and he's our former Democrat caucus chair. Next, Representative Earl Harris Jr., IBLC vice chair and House Assistant Democrat Whip. Representative Reagan Hatcher, IBLC treasurer and ranking minority member for House Courts and Criminal Code Committee. Representative Carolyn Jackson, she is our IBLC chaplain and ranking minority member for the House Select Committee on Government Reduction. Senator Eddie Melton, he is our ranking minority member for the Senate Education and Career Development Committee. Representative Gregory Porter, he is the ranking minority member for House Ways and Means. Representative Cherish Pryor, she is the House Democrat floor leader. And Representative Vanessa Summers, she is the ranking minority member for House Family, Children and Human Affairs Committee. We also have Senator Greg Taylor, who is the ranking minority member for Senate Tax and Fiscal Policy. Those who, who could not join us today, but they're here with us in spirit, is Senator Jean Bro. She is the Senate Assistant Minority Floor Leader, Ranking Minority Leader for the Senate Health and Provider Services and Insurance and Financial Institutions Committee. She's also the Vice Chair for the Senate Ethics, and she's Women Power Caucus Secretary. Representative Vernon Smith could not also make it. He is the ranking minority member for the House Education Committee. And Senator Lonnie Randolph, he is the Senate Democratic Minority Whip, and he's the ranking minority member for the Senate Judiciary and Public Policy Committees. Then there's myself. I am the IBLC Chair. IBLC Chair, I'm also the ranking minority member for our House Public Committee and the Vice Chair for the Women's Power Caucus. And I wanted to make sure we didn't forget our lovely executive director, who's the face of our organization, when you contact us, Raven Rajel. So we welcome you, we are glad you are here. I also wanna thank any elected officials 
anyone running for office candidates, any former elected officials that have joined us, please put a shout out in the chat. Let us know you're here. We appreciate you all supporting us and being here for the town hall. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robin. Marshawn, we'll come to you. Thank you uh, and good evening. Thank you for uh, being here with us. Um, the Indianapolis Recorder has been celebrating 125 years of preparing a conscious community. We have partnered with New America on uh, these series of conversations, looking at the Black community in, in, from the perspective of COVID, as well as just being in the Midwest. This is a special treat to have a number of uh, our leaders in the Black Legislative Caucus here to talk about both the work that they have done and the work that they um, have tried to do, and then also ideas that they would like to have from you as constituents. You're gonna hear about criminal justice and economic development, education, health and human services. You're gonna hear about important legislation that did not pass. You're gonna hear about criminal justice reform and other ideas, health disparities um, from leaders who are in the fight for us on our behalf. And so with that, what I'd like to do is turn it over to uh, Senator Taylor, who will give us an update on courts and criminal code. Senator Taylor. Thank you, Marshawn, and thank you to all those people who are watching this uh, presentation. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through some uh, bills that passed the uh, court and criminal justice uh, realm this past section. Um, we're limited in time, so I'll keep it to uh, a few of the bills that are in the uh, legislative legislation of interest that was uh, distributed and can be found on the uh, Indiana Black Caucus website. So I'm going to go through a few bills. They'll, I'll name them by number, but uh, uh, they can also be looked up that way by either the author or the uh, sponsors of the bill. So first of all, as all of us know, uh, in the state of Indiana, we passed expungement law uh, several years ago, giving people uh, exceptional opportunities to reclaim their lives and reclaim uh, opportunities in the workforce. We have, over the years, changed some of the legislation associated with that law, and this year we did the same. Um, for example, now, uh, speaking of waiting periods for expungement, there was a uh, consideration and a law was passed that said, for example, if you were charged with a level six or a class D felony under the old uh, criminal code and you waited, and let's say that, that you had to wait, part of your sentencing was once the actual uh, but you pass a probationary period that your then uh, class six felony would move to a misdemeanor. We had some discrepancies around the state as to when the time clock for that five year period would start. So for those people who have diversions from a level six or a class D felony down to a misdemeanor, the five year waiting period has now been put into law that it starts from the date in which the felony conviction was actually entered. So even if you get uh, charged with a felony and it moves to a misdemeanor, the time for your waiting period does not start when you convert it to a misdemeanor. It starts when you were convicted of that felony, uh, lowering the time period that you're gonna have to wait. Uh, House bill, 1264 has to do with child care background checks and that bill was sponsored by uh, Representative Chris May and it requires employees and volunteers of child care facilities who are present at the facilities to actually have a criminal national criminal background check. Um, it used to be that if you were going to be having any interaction with children that would be the uh, trigger for you to have a background check. Now it's if you're going to be on the premises. Um, House Bill 1313 for Courts and Family Law Matters, uh, Spencer, sponsored by Representative John Young, would increase the filing limit to $8,000 for all counties in the state of Indiana. 
we had changed the uh, limit on small claims court to 8,000 here in Marion County. And now that $8,000 limit for small claims is now applicable to the rest of the states. In addition to that, we also provided for child custody purposes, parenting time orders. As you know, um, we require that you inform the non-custodial parent or the custodial parent was supposed to inform the other parent whether or not they were relocating. And, and a lot of situations that might have been in, to, in town, you moving from one house to another, one apartment complex to another. We have changed that law that says that if you move less than 20 miles away, you no longer have to comply with giving uh, notice to uh, the other parent. So if you, if you are relocating, you no longer, as long as you're in less than 20 miles away or less than 20 miles from where you live, you can now forego that and don't have to do it. Um, last but not least, um, and again, this um, has to do with uh, jail overcrowding, uh, sponsored by Randy Fry in the uh, uh, House of Representatives, House Bill 1346, um, says that there that the state of Indiana is going to have an advisory council to conduct a state level review of evaluation of jail overcrowding in the state of Indiana. The second goal or duty of that committee is to develop alternatives to uh, incarceration and recidivism reduction programs at the county and community level to promote the development and the incorporation of evidence backed recommendations for county shares and strategies for jail. Um, we hope that that will lead to more uh, alternatives to people being behind bars, but give people opportunities to actually um, develop and hopefully uh, do their sentences without being in the jail system. And with that, I'm finished with uh, my portion of the criminal and uh, civil court That's issues. Standing for the Taylor. Thank you for that. Updates. Uh, now we're going to move to economic development and workforce with Representatives Earl Harris and Representative Cheris Pryor. Uh, thank you all for being here. I'm going to cover uh, just three bills. The first bill is House Bill 383, and that bill was actually authored by uh, our very own Senator Greg Taylor um, in the Senate and it was co-authored by several of the IBLC members, including Representative Porter and myself. What the bill does, it requires each educational institution, state educational institutions to submit an annual budget to the uh, state budget agency uh, each year. This is to provide greater accountability uh, for the institutions as it relates to their minority and women business spend. Um, so we're very excited about that bill and we're very thankful for Senator Taylor for introducing it. The second bill is House Bill 1009. Um, House Bill 1009, it, the title of it is Various Welfare Matters, uh, but basically what the bill does, it allows a student uh, to earn money and that money not be counted towards the family's ability to receive SNAP, Canna, and also if the child is going to school, it does not affect their ability to get financial aid. Uh, this bill is going to be very beneficial to families that are trying to um, make it work. However, um, a child, maybe the parents don't want the child to have a job because they're scared or fearful that it may take them over the limit. Um, this bill ensures that that will not happen. Also, if you are a census worker, uh, this is an amendment that we had added in the bill. Uh, if you are a census worker, that income that you earn as a census worker will not be counted towards TANF, SNAP, Medicaid, uh, the student lunch program, and it will not be used to determine eligibility 
for any state scholarships. Again, um, that was these are measures to ensure that people have an opportunity to earn a little bit of money uh, without them not being qualified for important state programs. And the last bill, House Bill 1143, that bill was carried by Representative Bob Morris. Uh, Representative John Barlett, who's a member of our caucus, was one of the co-authors uh, of that bill. And what this bill does, it prohibits an employer from requiring a candidate uh, for employment or an employee to have a device implanted or otherwise incorporated into the candidates um, as a requirement or a condition for, the, for their employment. So your employee cannot, say for instance, require you to have anything input into your body uh, if they want you to become an employee of that company. And that is it. All right. Hello, everyone. Good evening. I'm glad that you are with us in this new format of our town hall. I just want to talk very quickly about a couple. One that was mentioned earlier by um, Senator Taylor when he spoke House Bill 1264 about child care back uh, child care background checks. This is something that you know we we have to make sure that we protect our young children who cannot protect themselves. So I'm glad that we have put a lot of attention into this and proud to be a member of the legislature that passed this to make sure that our kids are safe and make sure that the right people are working in those type of uh, organizations. The other one I want to tell you about real quick is House Bill 1081. This has to do with the Commission for Supplier Diversity. Um, this actually comes came out of a committee that I'm part of. I'm one of the co-authors and then Senator Bro and Senator Randolph were two of the sponsors on the Senate side. And what this bill does is, it doesn't seem like a lot, but it actually is very important. It changes the name of the Governor's Commission on Minority and Women Business Enterprises to the Governor's Commission on Supplier Diversity. The thinking there is that it is more engulfing, or engulfs more. Um, and added to that is, it also includes the uh, membership scope has expanded to put a focus on veteran-owned small businesses. So along with the name change going along with that, the thought is that we wanted to include veterans and really cover every area in this. So that's the reason for the change and glad to see that the veterans will get a little bit more focus. So thank you. Thank you both for those important updates. Uh, this this uh, event is being streamed live on the Indianapolis Recorder uh, Facebook page. Uh, at this moment, I'd like to acknowledge our community partners, including the Urban League, Indiana Black Expo, the NAACP, the Indiana Minority Health Coalition, and NO Power. And with that, um, I will turn it over to Senator uh, Eddie Melton, who will talk about some updates on education. I'll be going over a few bills uh, regarding education. I'll be going over House Enrolled Act 1002, 1065, and 1066. And I'll try to get through this as quickly as possible. Uh, Enrolled Act 1002 removes the requirement school corporation annual performance evaluations plan must be based on objective measures for student achievement. Um, just kind of give you a little bit of background. Uh, state data shows that 98% of Indiana teachers are rated effective or highly effective by their administrators. Uh, the hold harmless measure that was in this bill is a key priority for uh, our educators, our teachers, uh, organizations like AFT and, and ISTA across the board. So this was something that we were very supportive of as they move forward. Uh, in, a, in a reversal of what some of our colleagues may have wanted to see, uh, they show overwhelmingly support for no longer requiring test scores to be a significant part of a teacher's evaluation. Uh, the state legislature is actually nine years behind in making this decision. This is something that should have been done several years ago. Uh, test scores don't always reflect the quality of instruction because there's no uh, significant way of outside uh, scores to be determined. So going to 1003, and 1002, just so you'll know, in the Senate passed 49 to one from a roll call perspective. 1003, just to give you a snapshot of what this bill is, and if you have the booklet uh, of the various bills that we're going over, uh, it provides a State Board of Education shall determine the timing, frequency, and the method 
of certain teacher training requirements, including whether the training should be required for preparation programs. So a little bit more background on this. The Act, House Enrolled Act 1003, will let schools apply for waivers for, from anything that doesn't involve safety, collective bargaining, budget, and test scores. This act also di directs the State Board of Education to examine how long and how often teachers have to go through training on topics from bullying all the way to epilepsy. Uh, teachers must undergo training on nearly two dozen topics. So this gives you an idea of the significance of this piece of legislation. Um, when we talk about House Bill 1003, it also allows any school to waive almost any statute within Title 20 or 511, dealing with the administrative codes uh, by applying for this through the State Board of Education. Uh, I want to go to House Bill 1065, and this was an extremely controversial bill, and I'm sure many of our educators that are watching today uh, remember House Enroll Act 1065. Uh, it's a, it's, it deals with a lot of uh, tax issues, but one of the most important pieces that especially impacts communities of color, uh, black communities, brown communities, low income communities across the state, uh, that it allows school corporations, traditional public school corporations, if they're going, that it will allow them to share their referendum dollars with charter schools. For example, local school board needs $10 million for the property taxpayers. They will possibly have to ask for $11 million to satisfy one of the local charter schools that's requesting. Uh, this was a last minute uh, amendment in this bill. The original bill itself did not carry this language, but we thought it was extremely important that, that you knew the impact that it could have in terms of some of the dollars into our traditional public education institutions. So, on that and learn more in your local communities about what this involves uh, and the engagement that the school corporation, the school board plays in terms of moving that forward. They have to agree on that. So just so you'll know, you'll be armed with the correct information. Again, that was House Enrolled Act 1065. I want to talk about House Enrolled Act 1066 uh, provides that a school corporation uh, shall accept transfer students who does not have legal settlement in a school corporation if the school district has the capacity to accept the and the student's parents is currently employed of the transferee school corporation with an annual salary uh, at least of $8,000 or $3,000 earned due to be being included as an employee. So I know that's a lot saying all, let me give you kind of a synopsis of what, what that's saying. Uh, the State Board of Accounts submitted a report that found that two school, uh, virtual school corporations, I'm sure many of you have heard about this, uh, Indiana Virtual Charter School and Indiana Virtual Pathways Academy collected tuition reimbursements for thousands of students who never attended those schools, as well as the fees for those students. So what we're talking about here is transparency and accountability within the virtual charter school realm. Uh, I know both in the House and the Senate, uh, both uh, the Senate Dems, Dems fought for legislation for more accountability of the resource of virtual charter schools, and that was not accepted in our amendments. This is something that we will continue to fight for as we look to make sure that public dollars are used appropriately and accountability is tied to that. Uh, and with that, that concludes uh, my presentation tonight on education. Thank you, Senator Melton. Uh, important updates for the community to be aware of. We will now go to um, Representative Robin Shackelford, who will update us on health and human services legislation. Thank you, Marshawn. Um, I just want to remind people that this was a short session that we just went through, so you won't hear about too many bills that impact the budget. This upcoming session, that's where you will hear about more bills that has an impact on our state and anything that you want requiring money or funds. So just keep that in mind. I'm gonna go over about five healthcare bills uh, that did pass through the health committee, whether it was on the Senate or the House. You may recall this was a session that we were trying to reduce the cost of healthcare costs overall and also pharmacy costs 
prescription costs for consumers. The first bill is Senate Bill 241. It's called Pharmacy Benefit Managers. During our summer study committee last year on prescription drug prices, we learned that a lot of the inflated costs uh, that consumers were experiencing were coming from a middleman like the pharmacy benefit manager. Their role basically is to negotiate the prices between the manufacturer and the insurance company. By the time we got through our study, most people just wanted to get rid of the pharmacy benefit managers, but we decided to go with a more conservative approach. This is Indiana. So what this bill does, it requires pharmacy benefit managers to get licensed by the state's Department of Insurance by December the 31st, 2020 this year. They have to now submit annual reports on their revenues and adhere to annual audits. So that was one step forward in trying to regulate the pharmacy benefit managers. The next one is Senate Bill 255, insulin drugs. We know insulin has been overpriced for years and causing diabetics and their families economic hardship in trying to purchase these drugs. Although this bill doesn't go far enough, it, is, it does help to reduce consumer costs. It is a small step in the right direction. The bill removes the requirement for a prescription to purchase insulin, which will allow people to purchase directly from the pharmacist. This type of insulin runs about $40, so removing that barrier will help you get that insulin directly from the pharmacist. We will still fight and continue to fight to make sure there's a cap on insulin because we think that will directly affect lowering net costs to consumers. Senate Bill 275, School Concussion Recovery Protocol. In order to ensure that a policy was drafted statewide and to protect our students who have concussions, this bill requires the Department of Education to develop and distribute by July 1st, 2021, a protocol who has received a concussion or head injury to return to classroom work. All schools, public and private, will have to comply with the requirements that the Department of Education come up with. Next, House Bill 1004. This was one of those large bills. Um, it was one of those other bills that we thought it was going to really reduce the health care costs for consumers, but it got watered down. It got a little messy. Um, so about time we got done with it, there is one good piece in here that remained um, to help directly with consumers. It is the good faith estimate requirement. Starting July 1st, 2021, healthcare providers have to provide a good faith estimate to individuals of the price for non-emergency services to be provided. So you would no longer have that sticker shock of once you go to the hospital, get a surgery, and you're getting various bills from the hospital, from a doctor, now they have to give you a good faith estimate. This will give more power to consumers to, to the ability to shop around because you will have that estimate in hand. So what was one of the benefits that came out of that bill? Lastly, House Bill 1207, Pharmacy Matters. This was another big pharmacy bill where we were trying to reduce the cost of uh, prescriptions, drug costs. It was actually authored uh, by Representative Davison, who is a pharmacist, who's been trying to get this legislation passed for years. I'm gonna go over four key points that came out of this legislation that helps you uh, and that will help our consumers. So one, it requires a health plan provider may not require, may not require a pharmacy or a pharmacist to collect a higher co-payment for a prescription drug from a covered individual than what is covered by the plan. So a provider or a pharmacy benefit manager can't say collect $100 uh, for this script, but the insurance company is only covering $50. That can no longer go on. Second, allows a prescription for a patient to be transferred electronically by a pharmacy to another pharmacy. Previously, your provider office would have had to authorize this, which delays you getting your script. So now that pharmacist can do that transfer electronically from pharmacy to pharmacy. The third one is, it requires a health plan to establish a procedure under which the amount paid by a covered individual for a covered drug purchase outside the plan 
is counted towards your deductible. So for example, if you pay $100 a month for a drug that is subsidized by a drug manufacturer because you're on their program, previously your insurance plan was not counting at $100 towards your deductible. Now this bill says they have to count that $100 towards your deductible. This is a step in the right direction. What we would like to see is that whole amount that's paid by you and the manufacturer of the drug get counted towards your deductible. And lastly, it requires an insurer when removing a prescription drug from the insurer's formulary or changing the cost share requirements, now they have to give the insured a 60 day notice and they have to provide an appeals process. So we heard from a lot of people that they were taking a drug, then it came off their formulary, they didn't even know it, so they went to try to get it or go to their doctor. Now if insurance company is gonna remove that, they have to give you a 60 day notice and let you appeal. So that is it for healthcare. Thanks everybody for listening. Outstanding, thank you for the updates. Uh, now we're gonna move to representatives John Bartlett and Carolyn Jackson, Representative Carolyn Jackson, to talk about miscellaneous legislation. Thank you. Okay, who's going first? You want me to go first? Yes, you can. Okay, very good. In miscellaneous uh, legislation, uh, well, first off, thank you all for going to the polls this year to vote and being a part of this process and supporting the Indiana Black Legislative Caucus. But, uh, uh, House Bill 1070 is a bill that's under miscellaneous uh, legislation, and it's a distracted uh, driving bill that I voted against, by the way, but you can no longer hold a handheld device in your hand while driving. Uh, they won't start taking points off your license until July 2021. But uh, used to, you couldn't text or read a text while driving. So now you can no longer hold, hold that handheld device in your hand. And we need to make you aware of that so that uh, police can now stop you and give them another reason to stop you if they see you holding that handheld device in your hand. I was opposed to it because of the fact that a lot of us use our phones for GPS. And uh, a lot of the young folks don't have late model cars, so they don't have a vehicle with the GPS system in, in their radio. So they do use their phone for GPS. So I did, I did vote against that bill, but it did pass. Second thing I'd like to talk to you about is uh, House Bill 1006. Uh, House Bill 1006 came from uh, a human trafficking task force that I started in 2017. And we've been kept keeping it going. And I don't think our state does enough to educate us on human trafficking. There are four parts of human, human trafficking. There's the sex trade, slave labor trade, the human organ trade. And also along the East Coast now, they're kidnapping young girls, breeding them and selling the baby. And we keep it hush hush. But from that task force uh, was born House Bill 1006. Used to, the age uh, to consent to marry in the state of Indiana was age 15. We wanted to move it to age 18. We couldn't fail that. So 16 and 17 is now the age you can consent to marry. But there's a process you have to go through uh, to marry at 16 or 17. First off, the 16 to 17 year old individual uh, that's getting married cannot marry someone more than four years their senior. Uh, that was okay with me because if I'm, a, if I'm a senior in high school and I'm 18 years old and I'm dating a freshman who's 14 years old, I graduate, start working, and we continue our relationship. I'm now 20, she's 16. That's four years. If we get married or I'm 21 and she's 17, but we yet have to go through that court proceedings and that process. Uh, the, the 16, 17 year old has to be emancipated through the court system. And that's huge because what was happening was we would have older folks marry younger people and traffic them, abuse them. And if you're not 18 years of age or have not been emancipated, then you cannot move out and rent an apartment. You have to be 18 years of age. 
also, if you want to file for divorce from that individual, if you're 15, 16, 17 years old, you cannot hire an attorney because you weren't 18 years of age. But once the court system emancipates you, then you have all those those rights. So you can leave your mate, you can rent an apartment, you can hire an attorney, and, and there are several uh, other rights and things that persons have to go through the court system and qualify through the court system and wait 15 days before they can apply for a marriage license. And with that, I'll stop, but please read out to a 1006. Thank you, Charles. Okay, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. I'm gonna just quickly go over House Bill 1265 which is a bill that requires all schools in the state of Indiana to test for lead. That bill was authored by myself, Carolyn Jackson, and co-authored by Representative Earl Harris, and one of my sen senator sponsors was Senator Lonnie Randolph. We initially thought this was a Lake County issue, but as we proceeded on with the bill, we found out it was not just Lake County, but it was an entire state issue. So what this bill does with requiring every school in the state to test for lead in the drinking water, if they test for the lead and they found out that the lead, that the water has over 15 parts per billion of lead in it, what that school will have to do is remediate it. Currently, there is funding available through the Indiana um, this uh, finance authority. And what it will do is it will pay for the lead testing as well as it will provide those individuals at the school with step-by-step -step, um, plan on what needs to be done to remediate the problem. Also in that bill, with regards to Lake County, Lake County will have to test the drinking water in the schools after 2023, every two years to ensure that the drinking water is safe. Now, the 15 parts per billion, it comes from the federal government. That is the requirement. Now, um, one of the things that was not in the bill that we will work to get in the, in the bill next year will be for those individuals who are in nursery schools, preschools, and in ministries. Those, as you know, are the, are the most at risk for the lead poisoning. But this was a big success, I feel, because so many children throughout the state were going to schools and we found out some of them had 8,000 times more than what was the requirement for the lead in the uh, drinking water. And just the bill alone, it a lot of schools that heard about it, they immediately turned the water off and ordered the children to bring water to school. So this was a good bill. And um, everybody voted for it. I think it passed unanimously out of both houses. So I thank those individuals for their support and for those of you who came down to testify. Thank you, Representatives Bartlett and Jackson for that important update and for continuing to fight for us. Uh, I see our audience has grown. My name is Marshawn Wally. I am a columnist of I'm Just Saying with the Indianapolis Recorder and we are partnered with New America, um, a national foundation. Uh, we are hosting the Indiana Black Legislative Caucus, who has been providing us updates on bills we need to know about, fights that they've won, challenges that they've had to overcome, and maybe some fights that they'll have to revisit over time. We've talked about courts and criminal code, economic development, education, health and human services, as well as uh, miscellaneous legislation ranging from updating the marriage age and uh, lead. Now we're gonna get into important legislation that did not pass. Um, I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't recognize our community partners, uh, the Indianapolis Urban League, Indiana Black Expo, NAACP, Indiana Minority Health Coalition, and NOAA. And with that, I will turn it over to important legislation that did not pass, Representatives Greg Porter and Representative Vanessa Summers. Thank you, Marshawn. Good evening, everyone. I'm so glad that you are here. I see that there are quite a number of people uh, that joined us on the watch party on Facebook, and I'm really glad to see you. I'm only going to talk about a couple pieces of my legislation. We had 
extreme lot of legislation that did not pass, did not get hearings. And uh, what we do with that legislation is we keep trying to, to take care of it year after year. Uh, one of mine is implicit bias in medicine. And um, any of us know that if we've ever gone to the hospital, it's, kind of more, it's difficult for black and brown to get their healthcare needs taken through the emergency room or any other room any other type of hospital setting. And we know that they think that um, our skin is tougher. They think that we can take more pain. And those things just are not true. So we have got to figure out some way to stop the bias in the medical field. The other one is we are go hopefully will be able to, to do some study on violent crime as a public health issue. Um, it is a. It was ahead of its scale, ahead of its time a couple of months ago, but right now I do believe that we all have um, PTSD from the things that we have gone through, and the things that we have witnessed and watched in the last couple of months. Uh, so those are a couple of the important things that I'm hoping to be able to take here again. I didn't get hearing. I really didn't ask for hearings because I really wanted to have those pieces of legislation in the long session in 2021, but I did introduce them. Um, only other thing that I probably would like to, to bring you uh, information about is uh, Representative Shackelford's Shackelford's 1406 expungement of juvenile records. So, of course, we know what the expungement is, and another one that uh, we could not get through the process, but we will continue to work um, on those issues. I'm going to stop there and let Representative Porter go from here. Thank you, Representative Summers. And again, we're all grateful for each and uh, one of you for being here with us this evening. You know, this session was a session, from my perspective, the bills that were not uh, passed were missed opportunities. And there are about 18 pieces of legislation, and you've heard from three of them, from Representative Summers, that was important to the Black Caucus, and, the, the, and they were bills that the Black Caucus authored. So I'm only going to hit on two or three other bills uh, that did not get hearings uh, in regards to this past session. One was uh, Senate Bill 3, uh, 287 which dealt with uh, scholarships for healthcare for minority students. Uh, we know the student that healthcare is, the healthcare disparities are, uh, it's, it's there, it's real, and it's alive. So we need to have more uh, individuals of color that go into the healthcare area. And that was uh, presented by uh, Senator Jean Bro, uh, and he did not receive a hearing, and probably because it was a non-budget year, but she put it on the, on, on the table to have some conversations this upcoming session. Uh, House Bill 1018 uh, that with Representative Harris, uh, and uh, he looked at uh, an issue in regards to hunger and homelessness uh, in regards to students. You know, that, that, there's a factor out there with students that are homeless, that are in, in college and are in, in high school, and they are uh, living in food desert. And the student homeless a study committee was a uh, committee that we, we were trying to get started so we can look at that. Uh, when you look at student debt, the average student debt in the state of Indiana is twenty nine uh, to $30,000. Uh, that's the average. So most of our students of color have uh, debt over $50,000. So this is important for us and we hope to have that looked at again next year. Uh, Representative Shackelford also talked about tenant rights that we did not get uh, uh, legislation passed on. And that was uh, looking at um, landlord-tenant legislation and looking at tenant rights. And as you well know, with the COVID-19, where we are, you know, we're, we're, we're really uh, got our knuckles bare in regards to looking at where, where we're going to be uh, when uh, people are, will begin to be evicted from their homes and, and, the, and the tenant legislation that's important to all of us. Um, House Bill 1167 uh, is a piece of legislation that I had dealing with uh, anti-bullying legislation. Um, traditional public schools have, uh, have to report bullying in their schools. Those, there are three institutions of uh, education that do not have to do that. 
Uh, non uh, public schools don't have to report bullying. Uh, charter schools don't have to report bullying. And choice uh, schools don't have to report bullying. Uh, if I believe if they receive uh, state dollars, that they should report that. Uh, we, we, charter schools give out $200 million. Uh, choice schools uh, get about $180 million. And we feel that they should uh, have uh, to report bullying in, in school. Um, also, uh, the last piece I'd like to talk about very briefly is racial profiling uh, by, by Representative Cryer. Um, it, it's, it's an ironic that we are where we are today in America in regards to racial profiling. This is, was uh, House Bill 1178, um, and she was uh, very instrumental along with the Black Caucus in trying to move that forward. And hopefully we will continue that fight. We will not uh, tarry from what we need to take care of uh, African Americans or people of color or poor people in general. And I thank you again, ladies and gentlemen. So we just received an update on important legislation that did not pass from Representative uh, Greg Porter and Representative Vanessa Summers. We're now moving to legislation of concern that did not pass. Um, this is uh, maybe our, our rallying cry potentially for next session, we will see. Uh, we have Representative uh, Reagan Hatcher who's gonna give us a quick update. Hi everyone and thank you for being on tonight. Uh, there are a couple things that I like to go over. Um, first we have House Bill 1279, that was the Indigo Bill. And the problem, initially the Indigo Bill started out talking about the Northwest Indiana Regional Development Authority um, and things that were gonna happen with that project. But they tacked on at the end a 10% requirement for Indigo to give back to um, the fiscal body of Marion County. And so what this did was cause a lot of problems with how Marion County tra public transportation would be used. Um, it will probably cut funding, which would be uh, another problem. So that was 1279. Um, it did not pass and we're glad that it did not pass. Um, House Bill 1355, that was a, a bill that I authored and put forward it's called a marital violence victim bill many times when spouses separate uh, they come together uh, usually in the same household if one spouse moves out then the other spouse should not have any kind of control over the property that the spouse moves to and that's all it said it just separated the residences of both spouses before the initial court hearing uh, it's Definitely for domestic violence victims, people who may have had to have a uh, protective order in place or some other kind of uh, restriction for one spouse to another. And finally, we have the Senate Bill 449. Uh, we had a big outcry on this bill. We had a number of people come to the State House uh, to lobby against this bill. Uh, and what it said was that it reduced the age to 12 of a juvenile that could be found guilty of murder. Uh, and then that juvenile would be tried as an adult, which is really scary because um, what we know now, especially through uh, all, the scientific world agrees that your brain is not fully developed until you're about 25 or so, 24, 25. So they are in this bill, they were trying to treat 12 year olds as an adult and put them in uh, the Department of Correction with other adults. And so this was a bill that did not pass, um, that we're very happy that did not move forward. Thank you. Thank you for that update. Uh, we are uh, continuing to see our audience grow. Keep the comments and the question coming at, um, later on in the program, we will have a robust uh, Q&A of our panelists. We are with the Indiana Black Legislative Caucus. The community partners include the Indianapolis Urban League, IBE, NAACP, Indiana Minority Health Coalition, and NO Power. At this point in the program, what we're going to do is have more substantial updates on um, IBLC justice reform agenda, as well the, as the Health Disparities Minority Task Force, and then also an update 
on uh, response rates to the census, the 2020 census. And so with that, I will now turn it uh, this over to Senator Eddie Melton. Thank you. Like it was mentioned earlier through Representative Porter that we, not only as a nation, but here in Indiana, have been dealing with and, and fighting against racism, uh, police brutality, and a variety of other issues in our systematic uh, policies uh, throughout this nation and state, uh, it was extremely important that the Black Legislative Caucus here in Indiana came together and to issue a direction on what direction the governor, but not only the governor, but the legislative body should take to make action on the issues that we've seen that has caused so much unrest in our nation today. So we want to thank everyone that have shared their thoughts and input. Uh, the list and the things I'm going to share today is not complete. This is our starting point. Uh, for example, tonight is an example where we're looking for your thoughts and feedback as we continue to build on policies that we feel that's going to help change the direction of especially the policing situations we have in the state. But I want to be clear, members of this caucus Everyone on this call have been and have filed legislation on these issues for a number of years. And I think we have to acknowledge that and make sure that's clear. But as we move forward, we wanted to look at it from a two-phased approach. We're in phase one right now. We wanted to give some direction and urge the governor to make some action steps. And number one, that action step is to issue an immediate executive order to ban law enforcement from using the chokehold restraint or other means of restraint that cut off the ability to, as a means of asphyxiating an arrest in Indiana. This order must be, include specific repercussions of officers that will face for violating this ban. Now we must make sure whatever policies we set forth, there is accountability attached to those things. So we have to make sure that that's in place. Number two, if the governor does not act on this, uh, this rule or the executive order, we urge Indiana mayors, city councils, and chiefs of police to immediately establish a local policy that does the same thing that our laws are used of the chokehold restraint if the governor does not move forward. Additionally, we urge these entities to immediately implement the use of body cameras for all patrol officers and require them to be on at all times. If not, again, a penalty should be assessed. We also urge the governor to immediately establish a statewide criminal justice commission that's permanent, not just for a moment, but also making sure that they include a diverse appointment of civilian representatives from the communities across the state that are African American and that have experienced criminal justice uh, in various fashions and have seen how it can treat us in a disproportionate way. But the objective of this commission is to look and study the existing laws that have historically oppressed communities of color and that have shown systemic racism over the years and prepare that for the 2021 legislative session. So again, these are steps immediately that the governor can take that can move us forward. And we urge the mayors and city councils and chiefs across the state of Indiana to immediately establish an independent civilian review board uh, with members selected by the local community. Now, this is something different that we've seen in other communities where they're appointed politically. And we're urging local communities to establish a method or a process to select uh, these board members in a very open and inclusive manner uh, to review public complaints on police violence. Now, those are the phase one immediate action steps. We're well aware that many organizations like the Urban League, like the NAACP, and Can't Wait for Eight, and a variety of other organizations have policy recommendations, which we're gonna talk about the ones that we have now. So we're looking at all those things. Uh, we wanna be as, as inclusive and strategic as possible as we move forward. But some of the bills that we're looking at as, as a Black Caucus is, uh, again, recommending the Statewide Criminal Justice Commission that will offer up legislative action items in addition to this, uh, but the statewide use of body cams and dashboard cameras, local wide special prosecutor for police misconduct, use of fatal and excessive force. We think that's extremely important as we look for transparency in these special cases. 
public reporting of lethal force involvement of law, law enforcement. One of the key things that we're seeing across this nation is the lack of collecting data and the fact of sharing that data and making that data public when it comes down to law enforcement and, and, and the misconduct of law enforcement. We need a statewide public database for citizens and complaints against law enforcement to be made public in that fashion. It was mentioned before, we know that Representative uh, Porter said this, but also bills that's been filed by Senator Greg Taylor for anti-racial profiling laws. Uh, also enhanced penalties for all officers involved in shootings. We're looking at inclusive hate crimes legislation. We know that last session, it was a session that we dealt heavily with the hate crimes law and, and it needs to be strengthened. And there are some areas that need to be improved for us to be one of the states that have a very comprehensive hate crimes piece of legislation on the books. But one that's also controversial and I think is gonna be helpful, and we put this down as a caucus, ensuring that the FOP contracts are public record and requiring a public hearing for, this will give a very clear, transparent process for the public to participate, especially when we talk about how an officer may or may not be reprimanded or held accountable for any actions of violence or death of a citizen. Reviews for police officers is another recommendation legislatively. Confidential whistleblower complaint process for officers and urge officers to use their influence while on the job to help de-escalate and intervene when there's a situation that arises with their colleague. And again, implicit bias training, dispute resolution and de-escalation de training is something that we have to fight for. Again, these are just examples of the legislation that have already been filed, things that we're going to be filing again uh, and, and adding to that list. But the purpose of tonight is to listen and to take in more recommendations as we prepare for the 2021 session. And that concludes the presentation for tonight with that. Thank you, that sounds like a, a robust agenda. Um, things that you all have been working on and things that you all have been thinking about in response to um, everything that's happened more recently. I wanna make sure that we encourage our participants who are participating in this um, event to ask questions and be prepared to get those questions into the chat or to send them in the Q&A section so that we can have a robust conversation and get um, public input on the information that the IBLC is presenting to us. Uh, it is always important to hear from our leaders and, it, and they are doing what they're supposed to do by coming to the community, informing us, empowering us, and giving us an opportunity to provide some information. And so with that, what I wanna do is turn it over to um, health, to talk about health disparities and the minority task force, uh, go back to Representative Robin Shackelford. Thank you. Thank you, Marshawn. Uh, just to piggyback on what Eddie was saying, when you do send in your ideas and concerns, we will be expanding that legislative plan, not only to include social justice, but we will be including economic empowerment, education, and health. So we know that is just a piece of what needs to be fixed, and we need to look at some of these preventive things. So feel free also to send in your suggestions for some of those other pieces that we'll be working on. Speaking of health disparities, due to COVID, uh, we learned pretty early after we asked for race data to be released, the State Department released that data and we saw that Blacks were 20% more likely to test positive and to die from COVID-19. One of our call to actions was to set up an immediate task force to look at these health disparities and come up with a corrective action plan by June 30th. Well, the governor did hear our call. We set up a task force. The conveners were the Indiana Minority Health Coalition, the State Department of Health, Office of Minority and Health, the Interagency of State Council on Black and Minority Health, and IMHC did a large part for doing that, hosting the committees, being our uh, navigators throughout the committees. We had eight committees that we formed. One was incarceration and detained. That included the prisons, the juvenile detention centers, sheriff and local jails, et cetera. We had the immigrant migrant population, also included undocumented, the un and the underinsured, the frontline workers, nursing home and long-term care assistant living facilities, 
and 65 and older. We had a committee called Underlining Conditions, and this is the committee that I sat on. We looked at pregnant women, chronic diseases, and homelessness. We also have a committee on communication and education, a comprehensive campaign. And then lastly, we put together the special interest clusters, which included groups like IMHC, the federally qualified healthcare centers, faith-based organizations, community-based organizations, and the area on AGs. They were all in one group. The last committee met today, that was the Committee on Incarceration. Each committee met twice this committee felt they needed another uh, day to meet, so they met three times. All the committees will have to submit their notes by this Friday. We will then have external editors to review it. We have asked Dr. Kevin Brown from IUB and Dr. Beth Meyerson. So they're gonna be our review team and edit team. Then I will take a look at it along with some of my colleagues from the IBLC. We also included reports from best practices, so that will be included in there. So we just wanna make sure that people also know that uh, people want this committee to be ongoing. After we submit our report June 30th, we will present it to the Summer Study Committee so they can look at these options, so we can act upon this and give funding to it. And we will try to keep this committee ongoing because as you know, we have been fighting health disparities for years. This is gonna take years to get us through. So we will continue to find a way to keep this task force going. So we just wanted to make sure that you got an update that we are working, our requests are being heard, and that was one of them that did get implemented. Thanks for listening. Thank you for the update. Again, let's make sure we get our questions in. This is a um, unique opportunity to have so many um, illustrious leaders within our General Assembly um, coming to us, providing updates and seeking input and asking for you know, reactions to some of the ideas that they are presenting. Uh, that is, in fact, a hallmark of great leaders that they listen and they seek input. Uh, what we're going to do now is move to a quick update on uh, response rate to the 2020 census. We know that uh, there's been a little bit of controversy relative to how, the, the, you know, 45 was trying to use um, the census to do some things. We're here now. And so uh, what we got to do is figure out how to, you know, get counted. So with that, what I'll do is turn it over to Representative Earl Harris. Thank you. I want to give some information. You know, we know we knew walking into 2020 that elections were going to be one of our largest issues. Up there, pretty close to that was the census. Uh, just a reminder, everyone counts in the census. It doesn't matter your age. So if you had a baby that was born a month ago, they count. It doesn't matter your place of birth, meaning if you were born here in the United States or not, um, does not matter. The, the census is something that is required by the Constitution. And by law, all responses are confidential. Again, I want to repeat that. All responses are confidential. Your personal information cannot be shared with any law enforcement agencies. So there are three ways to respond. Um, one of them is new this year. You can actually go online and respond at 2020census.gov. Again, that's 2020census.gov. Uh, back in March, April, the census started to send out mailers to people that they could have responded that way. So by mail is one way. And if you're not comfortable with those, you can also call in and they can take your information over the phone. Um, if there is no response from your household, starting in August, people will be going to those houses where they did not receive a response to get your information from your home. And connected to that, I want to let everyone know there are job openings with the census. So if you're interested in being a person that goes out and tries to get that additional information, there's, there's multiple positions. You can go to 2020census.gov forward slash jobs. Again, that's a place you can get hired. They're part-time jobs. They work great if you only work the weekend, if you only work evenings, whatever the situation is, they have adjustable schedules for you to do. Why the census matters, I'm gonna give you three main reasons. Those reason, reasons are funding, power and intelligence. So we'll start with funding. The census data directly affects how more than $589 billion per year in federal and state funding is allocated to communities for neighborhood improvements. This means public health, hospitals, education, trans transportation, and more. Uh, that, is, that equates to $5 trillion over a 10-year period. 
So again, this is important for your community in terms of knowing how many people are there and how funding will be distributed. When you talk about power, it affects our US House of Representatives. There are 439 seats in the US. Indiana currently has nine. So depending on your populations, you can lose or gain seats. So this is something that you really wanna be involved in to make sure that we get out, we continue to keep nine, if not gained by population, more seats as years go by. It also uh, connects to our legislative districts, our school district assignments, uh, other things that are related to government. And then the last one is intelligence. This really gives us a snapshot of what the community is and what it needs. So when you talk about services for the elderly, where do new roads need to be built, schools, where are job training located, that's connected to the census. In terms of nonprofits and for-profit businesses, where they decide to um, locate is connected to that. And so when you talk about nonprofit and for-profit businesses, you also talk about jobs. So you wanna make sure that you get counted so that there is a show of need in your area and the possibility of bringing more nonprofit and for-profit businesses in there. Just wanna remind you of some things because sometimes people try to scam people and get information and act as if they're involved with the census when they're not. The census will never ask you for your social security number. They will never ask you for bank account or credit card numbers, nothing to do with your political party, money or, or donations. So I just wanna keep you uh, informed about that. Uh, I know that I, and I believe Representative Pryor, there may have been someone else, we created legislation a couple of years ago and put it in in preparation for the census. Unfortunately, um, those bills did not become law, and there really has not been what we believe should be the proper amount of funding in Indiana, because I don't believe there really is any funding put into the census and making sure this happens. So what has happened is there's a lot of community groups and areas that have gotten involved with this, so I'm glad to see that. So when you talk about the numbers, Indiana's self-response rate is 65.6%. So we're kind of in the middle. We're not at the bottom, we're at the top. We're in the middle. 50.5% um, of those responses have been done over the internet. So it's good to see the people are using the online part. Um, nationally, the national rate is 60.9%. So we are above that. And then the national internet rate is 48.9. So we're above the national. Uh, but we want to make sure that we raise this number and get it higher. And again, people will be going out if you have not responded. And again, I want to please urge you, if you have not responded to the census, respond and remember that everyone in the states, everyone that lives here counts. Thank you. Thank you for that update. I, I recall that the black response rate uh, in Indianapolis and Marion County was of some concern. I, mean, I think it might have been as low as 30%, something around there. So um, what I'd like to do now, and since we are a little bit ahead of schedule, our, our elected officials did an excellent job of being concise. Um, I didn't have to stop any of them. So that, that's great. So kudos to our elected officials. I'd like, it's almost like they practiced this and were prepared. That's awesome. So what I'd like to do is take a little bit of time and do some education just in general on you know, what is the Black Legislative Caucus um, as far as, you know, wh why do you do these things? When did it start? Um, I'd like to go to uh, Representative Porter real quick and talk about maybe the beginning of, the, of this, because I think maybe you might have been familiar, you know, <laughs> when it happened and then go to Representative Shackelford to talk about like the future. So, We'll go to uh, Representative Porter, for, if you don't mind, and then go to back to Representative Shackelford for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marshawn. And um, I'm going to get my partner in crime, uh, Representative Summers, because she, she's, she's uh, been, been around about a year or so longer than I have. Okay. But uh, our, our fearless leader uh, back in the day was Representative Hurley Goodall. Uh, back in the back in the 80s, uh, started uh, Indiana Black Legislative Caucus with Representative Crawford and, and, and uh, no, Julia Carson and people like that. And the whole point was it was there were only like five or six legislators at that time, and and, and their whole goal was to uh, begin to position themselves to make significant change in, in regards to committees. They sat down and, and strategized what committees to be on 
in order to address uh, the needs of the African American community and, and, and the low income individuals. And over the years, we, we, we're grown. Uh, uh, we, we have uh, right now uh, 12, 13 members of the Black Caucus now. Uh, we, we have some more members that are going to come, we're going to come this, uh, in 2021. And we're very excited about where we are, not only here in, in Indiana, but also uh, nationally. We, we are a black, the Black Caucus has uh, officers on the National Black Caucus state legislators, and we are beginning to impact th this whole nation. So uh, I yield right now, if you allow me to Representative Summers, who, who father also served, and uh, Representative Summers. Um, I just want to add that um, along with uh, Representative um, Hurley Goodall, uh, my father, the late Joseph Summers, and we're going to talk about the late Bill Crawford, all uh, formed or had parts in become of the IBLC becoming um, an entity. They also had um, a hand in getting the uh, National Black Caucus of State Legislators together. So as they were organizing that organization, they were also organizing the state of Indiana. Um, they have always been able to at least tell what we were, you know, tell what we're doing, tell our story um, and how it affects and how it affects um, us as a whole. And, and so we just, we know we stand on the shoulders of greatness. Um, and we just want to make sure that we make them proud of us, making sure that we take care of uh, the constituents in the state of Indiana. Thank you for that uh, bit of history. Uh, we are, I'd like to go to Representative Robin Shackelford, who's currently uh, the servant leader of the IBLC. I've noticed, um, so first, I think this is the first time you all have done a Zoom town hall. Is that correct? And I know that you all have done town halls in the past. I've also noticed um, statements. I know you maybe have done statements in the past, but I've noticed them more frequently. Um, there's, there's a lot of energy right now amongst um, Black organizations and Black leaders. And um, there's definitely inter energy within the IBLC. Can you talk about that energy that you're seeing and maybe um, what you think the future direction might look like of the IBLC, particularly as a partners with the community? So I am excited to see that energy. I think now because of everything that's going on, everyone wants to partner with IBLC. They see us as the lead when it comes to policy for issues that affect our community whether it's corporate America, faith-based, a lot of our youth. So we want to grow so we can help represent our community. We also want to grow our programming as we're hearing the community needs. One of the things we want to start doing is a youth advocacy or an advocacy boot camp for everyone. People have explained they want to learn how to advocate. They need to learn a process, the players. We usually uh, put in an advocacy piece when we did our town halls but we're gonna make that virtual and set up that advocacy piece. And then also we heard from the youth, they would like to see some type of IBLC Youth Government Council. We do have a governor's uh, council and we have a mayor's council, but nothing at the legislative level, nothing that is specifically targeting our youth. So they are excited right now, we're excited, they're excited. So what we wanna do is put these programs in place as we build the future and try to grow our caucus and try to grow, grow input from the community. One of the things I appreciated about um, one of the giants whose shoulders everyone is standing on, uh, Senator Glenn Howard, was that oftentimes he operated within the minority. So when he was in the city county council, um, he was in the minority. When he went to the Senate, he was also in the minority. And right now, um, you all sit in minority positions within the, the House and the Senate. But uh, the important thing to know about Senator Howard, the late Senator Howard, is he never had a minority mentality. There was an expectation that you all would work and maneuver to pass legislation. And um, I've appreciated watching the battles that you all have won and even the fights that you picked uh, in part. And I'd like to see if um, you all could talk about that. I know 
Um, hate crimes has been a long battle. Um, I know that there's also been some battles with um, ethnic studies and, and things of that nature. Can, can you all talk about some of those long-term battles that you've had to have um, on behalf of the community and the persistence that has occurred because of that? Well, I'll let some of my other, speak, other members speak. I'll give them a chance because I know we have a lot of battles that we've been working on, especially hate crimes, school deserts. So someone else want to speak on that? Um, I guess the hate crimes, first of all, let me give credit to my colleague, Greg Porter, and you've talked about the other people who fought for that issue well before I was a member of the General Assembly. Um, I can tell you uh, that fighting for issues in our community, not only do we have to fight uh, the upward battle of getting that legislation heard, but then we have to fight what I call the ugly battle of making sure that language stays the same. And <clears throat> over the years, I've learned one very important message that, uh, uh, that Bill Crawford taught me, which is you can take no pride in authorship, especially when you're in the minority. And, but one of the things that I too take pride in is when I submit language and somebody takes it and changes it, to totally contradict what I'm saying, um, uh, it, it offends me. And that, quite frankly, uh, Marshawn, that's what happened in the bias crime situation. I don't know, but I'm pretty sure that none of the members on this uh, call, members of the General Assembly on this Zoom, actually voted for what we now call hate crimes legislation in Indiana. Um, so it's very frustrating, it's very cumbersome, um, ethnic studies, I ended up getting a, a sponsor, which was Senator Cruz. I know that shocks a lot of people, but I sat down and talked to him and he said, sure, let's get it done. Uh, now I wanted to start it back in elementary school, but, uh, you know, every small step leads to a bigger step in my opinion. And we started in high school. So now every high school authors and uh, offers an, uh, ethnic studies course. So it just depends on the issue. And I think that it's, it's, we've got a great team. We've got people with expertise in all areas. And that is a benefit to me because we could pass off things that we know more about than the other ones. So it's still, it's tough, but it's getting better. We want to make sure that we get to guest questions. Uh, but I did want to give Representative Porter just a couple minutes to talk about this fight on hate crimes. That's one of the, the marquee battles that I have seen in my short time of being on this earth, watching someone go. Since I, since I was a page for you when I was a little boy, that's one of the, the, the fights that I've seen that um, really mattered. And so after Re Representative Porter goes, I'm going to bring in Molly Martin, who will kick off our Q&A with um, the, the, the guests. Thank you. Thank you, Mashawn and uh, Senator Taylor. I want to thank the, the whole entire Black Caucus family. Um, when I talk about hate crimes and where we are now, and I talked about, I, we started this fight uh, in another century. It was the 20th century we started this fight in regards to bias crime, hate crime legislation. And now we're in the 21st century. Uh, Glenn Howard and, and I was the first ones that started back in, in, in the in, in, uh, 80s. And um, we, you know, we, we really worked hard on that. I think it was 90, 97, I do believe, I'm sorry, that we, we worked on that. And uh, Glenn carried it, I had it, and we just kept going. And, you know, when, you, when you're about to write and, and you know you want to be on the right side of the, of the issue, you, you, you continue to fight. And people say, you know, why do you keep doing it? Because, you know, I want, we wanted to be the right. And... We're not happy that uh, the governor thinks he can check a box and get off a list because that list is totally incomplete. And there's another missed opportunity for our state when it comes to bias crime legislation. But we are no ways tired. We will continue to fight. We will amend. We will always look for opportunity to amend a, a bill to, to, to uh, take us to the finish line. Thank you.
you for that. And now I'd like to bring in my co-moderator, uh, Molly Martin with New America. Thank you so much, Marshawn, and thanks again to the members and to everyone tuning in. If you're just now tuning in, my name is Molly Martin, and I direct New America Indianapolis, a partner with the Indianapolis Reporter and the Black Legislative Caucus in this conversation. We're getting a lot of questions, a reminder that if we don't get to yours, we will make sure to reach back to you and that these get in front of the members. But I want to leap in, everyone, with a question about um, all of the talk uh, of police reform and combating state violence. There is a lot of interest in the chat and there have been many questions about whether or not you're supportive of what they call defunding, but what we know of as restructuring police forces, having folks reapply for jobs, uh, restructuring and using a more community-based model for establishing police and safety forces. Think of Camden, New Jersey and other models. Would anyone like to speak to their interest or support in that idea? I see Representative Summers nodding. Would you like to go? And I think you're muted, so. Uh, <laughs> She's um, not. Go ahead, and Cherish, Rep Representative Pryor. You do. You're going to say yeah. what we all say. <laughs> yeah, I think um, I, I think the term defunding is is a term that's used, but it's not necessarily the true definition of what people are meaning. Uh, obviously, we do have to have a police department. Um, if kids come up missing, if there is domestic abuse, things of that nature. So we do have to have a police department. But I think that there is a need to look at how police departments are funded um, and where that money goes to. For instance, do police officers really need the, the military tanks um, and all the equipment they are receiving from the military? Do they really uh, uh, need all that? and making sure that we're putting more money into preventative services. If you look at the budget, even locally here in Marion County, um, anywhere north of 80% of the local budget goes to public safety. Now that includes the judicial system as well as the police department. But that's a lot of money that's going just towards um, criminal justice and public safety. So uh, I think that we do support looking at um, those budgets and making sure that money is spent properly. Um, and, you know, um, there are a lot of reforms that need to be made in the police department um, from the FOP. Um, down to uh, any number of major, any other type of items. So um, the word defunding is something that we realize uh, that it's not necessarily the best word. Uh, maybe a major surgery uh, and a facelift is a much way, much better use of the term as it relates to the police department and the funding of it. Thank you, Representative Pryor. And I would say to all of the members of the caucus, there's a lot of support in the chat for the ideas uh, earlier about independent community review boards and being very cautious about how that membership reflects the community and is chosen. Uh, would anyone else like to add to the defunding point before the next question? Representative Harris. Yeah, I just want to add one real quick thing. And this, this was actually something from a conversation that Representative Porter and I had earlier today. You know, there's a lot of times that the police are called out for things that really should be covered by somebody else when you talk about social services. If you're talking about a situation where there's a homeless person or a mental um, person, or not mental person, but a person that's having an issue, um, when you talk about kids, those are not things my guess is most police officers want to be called out for. So when, you talk, when we talk about restructuring things, we need to look at putting in those social services to help people that Police should not be the frontline person to come out there. There should be other people that can help them, other counselors, et cetera, that can help people uh, instead of the police and putting the police really in a situation that they should not be in that could lead to something bad. Thank you, Representative Harris. Uh, we've actually just had a question come in that relates less to the point of detention or arrest and more to the point of, of being in jail or being in prison, and that's the issue of cash bail. So would anyone like to speak to priorities related to cash bail? Is it on the table to end cash bail in Indiana? Well, I'll just speak to a break. I think that kind of defaults to me under the criminal uh, session. Okay. okay. 
Chair, go ahead, Rob. Chair, no, go ahead. Madam Chair. No, go ahead. I was just going to talk since so anybody else put their hand up. So you can go ahead. This is more your expertise. Oh, okay. Well, Okay, well, my internet connection is kind of unstable. So here, here's what I say about cash bail, and people need to understand um, every jurisdiction in the state of Indiana has a different cash bail uh, standard. In other words, you could be one county over, and your bail would be at a different amount depending on the uh, what, what we call, what the judicial system calls their bail schedule. And we need to be more standard than that just to start right off the top. The second piece is, what does cash bail do? Does it ensure someone showing up for court? And if it does, then why don't more people show up for court? So the standard first, and then does it achieve the objective? The last part is, do we know that the bail system actually favors those who have resources. It doesn't help with the equity and justice that we're looking for. What it does is it creates winners and losers from poor people to wealthy people to middle-class people. And the judicial system is supposed to be about justice. Not we need to look at the whole system. The first step, however, is to have parity across the, the state and make sure that everybody is under the same system so that you know where you go, whether or not you're gonna be charged a certain amount for depending on what you're charged with. Thank you so much. I'm gonna hit and, it back. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Did I just hear someone? No, no, I wanted to make sure everybody heard me. My connection is terrible. Yeah. <laughs> no worries. So, um, question about, and this looks like a question about housing. So um, the, the community in general, along with an effort headed by the Hoosier Housing Needs Coalition, has asked Governor, Governor Holcomb to appoint a housing stability lead to coordinate all state, federal, and philanthropic resources to deter an occurrence of mass evictions that could possibly occur after the deadline moratorium on evictions set on uh, June 30th. What resources and help is available for both renters and landlords to prevent a housing crisis and cause even more of a rise in the homeless population and vacant housing in our communities? Representative Shackleford. Thank you, Marshawn. I'll just touch a little bit on that since I did have one of those um, anti-eviction bills this past session. For as far as help, uh, there's not enough help out there for renters. Uh, we're not giving enough renters assistance. We haven't studied it. So that kind of commission setup would be great. If you have a mortgage, if you're a landlord, we have resources out there that will pay up to six months of your mortgage, whether it's because your renter can't pay or you can't pay. So that's with the hardest hit fund. And I think it'll pay up to $30,000 of your mortgage, but it's for six months of that mortgage. We don't have that same type of help when it comes to the renter side. Once the moratorium ends, we need to be doing something else to help out the renters to get them through to the year, the end of the year, to next year, until this crisis is over and people can go back to work. And Robin, when we met with the governor, we did share that with the governor that we do, did need that to happen for our renters when the uh, moratorium was over so that uh, they could uh, not be evicted at that time. And we did put that in the governor's lap. Yes. Representative Brown. And also I think um, for now, people should look at um, the township uh, trustee's office, particularly here in Marion County, um, that can help pay, may be able to help pay uh, as well, and if people have are having problems with their utilities, there is also uh, assistance as well uh, with the Indiana Housing um, uh, Coalition um, to help people pay for their uh, pay for their utilities as well. I think I saw Representative Porter. Was your hand? Did you raise your hand? Yes, yes, I did. Uh, and I, I just want to talk a little bit about the fiscal perspective of it. 
um, as we have met with the governor, you've heard my colleagues say, we still have $2.4 billion that we got from federal government and the CARES Act, and we should be able to use some of those dollars. We, we've only expended as the state $300 million of that, uh, of that 2.4 billion. And there are some, there are dollars out there uh, that this governor can take and move toward addressing uh, the, the potential tsunami of evictions that will happen uh, in, in the month of June, June and, and uh, I mean, July and August. Thank you. Question that kind of, that came up, uh, COVID-19 related. Are you all comfortable with the state opening to stage four of COVID, of the COVID reopening plan? Uh, and the questioner points out that Indiana positive cases per total, per total tested is 11.8%. And they say that that's still high and we're in the bottom 10 of 50 states on numbers tested per 1,000. So they're saying our positive cases are pretty high and um, we're not testing as well as other states. And then Rhode Island, by comparison, has 173 people to 1,000. Indiana has 48 to 1,000. The national average is 69 to 1,000 citizens uh, tested. So they just wanted to get your sense. Should we be re reopening to stage four? Senator Melton. Yeah, I'll just share some thoughts on that myself. I believe that uh, for me personally, it is moving a little bit too fast. I know here in Gary, we've seen our numbers uh, triple uh, in, in, the, in the number of cases. Uh, when we sat with the, the governor uh, as a caucus, we also urged him to collect the data per zip code and extremely, uh, the extreme importance of that in terms of the resources that Representative Porter mentioned on how to distribute and disseminate those resources, testing, treatment, and et cetera. But with the CARES Act, we need to make sure that there's an appropriation of those resources where those communities have been most impacted by COVID-19. I know a lot of municipalities will be applying for funding uh, because of expenses related to COVID-19, but there's a variety of other areas, especially in the black communities where we have the higher rate uh, of, of, of attracting uh, the virus. So I think we, we're gonna see more and more issues that arrive. Uh, and I think 2021 legislative session is going to be uh, packed with a variety of issues as COVID-19 related, as race relations related. Uh, it's a budget session. And it, so it's going to be extremely engaging, uh, controversial, and that's why it's important that folks that are watching today and not watching, that they pay attention on how uh, the Indiana General Assembly moves forward on these issues. Any other? Representative Jackson and then Harris. You're muted, Representative Jackson. Thank you. I would just like to piggyback on uh, Senator Melton's comment. <clears throat> I am his neighbor, Hammond, right next door. And right next door to me is the state of Illinois. And when we open up, and Illinois has not opened up, we get a rash of individuals from Illinois over here. And it's very concerning, especially when here in Lake County, Hammond has the largest number of COVID-19 cases. So not only do we have in our city um, the casino, but you got stores that are opening up and everything, all kinds of businesses. And in Illinois, those businesses are closed. So what you're getting is, you're getting people from Illinois coming over, they're wearing no masks, they have no protection on, and we're definitely afraid that they're going to cause our numbers here in Northwest Indiana to skyrocket. So those comments have been addressed with the governor, and I'm guessing that is why he put us on the, the schedule to open up behind everybody else, but we're still opening up in front of Illinois. Thank you for that, Representative, I believe it was Harris that had something. Yeah, and, and Representative Jackson hit on what I was going to talk about. When you talk about Representative Hatcher and Senator Melton that are Gary residents, uh, Jackson and Hammond, and I'm in Chicago, 
we do. We get a huge influx of Illinois people, which, you know, it's been great when they go to our grocery stores and they spend money. But in this case, it's not so great. Um, when, you know, again, as Representative Jackson talked about things opening up, we have beaches. Gary, East Chicago, Hammond have beaches. And if I'm not mistaken, there was a lot of people coming over the state line when our beaches opened up. So, you know, we are the second largest, uh, we have the second largest number behind Marion County here in Lake County of positive tests, uh, positive tests, deaths, et cetera. And so it's a real concern for us on how this happens because those numbers, you know, we're, we're seeing in other parts of the country that those numbers are starting to go up. We have a huge concern of that here. And as Senator Melton said, we're going to have a lot of legislation that's going to be related to the effects of COVID coming in 2021. Um, so that's something that's going to be with us for a while. Uh, Representative Shackelford. Thank you, Marshawn. I just wanted to add on here in Indianapolis, especially on the east side, the far east side, we've got zip code 46218. We have not had enough blacks tested. We haven't had enough testing sites in our black communities. Uh, Eastern Star had a testing site temporarily for two weeks. So a lot of our people don't know if they have COVID, if they had it. A lot of them don't understand the antibodies tests. What does that mean? Uh, thinking that they may be immune from it. So with the lack of education and the lack of resources, there's no way that we can say in our communities that we should be opening fully in July until we can address some of these issues and also address our underlying illnesses issues that make us more susceptible when we do get COVID, whether it's obesity, diabetes, high blood pressure, um, some of those diseases that we already have, and then when we get COVID, it makes it even worse. So I see that Representative Paris wanted to add on, and then I'd like to go to Molly so that she can move to the next question. Yep, I just wanted to add real quick, one of the things, and we started questioning this, when you talk about the Indiana uh, Department of Health, there wasn't a free testing site in the area. Um, so I believe a couple of days ago, it opened up in Maryville. It would, you know, we would have appreciated if it was in maybe Gary or Chicago or Hammond, but at least there's something in the vicinity. But it shouldn't have taken questions starting to pop up on why there wasn't a a site in the area before one popped up. Thank you for that. And now I'll turn it over to Molly Martin. Sure thing. I do want to acknowledge everyone who is submitting questions, both on Facebook and via Zoom. They're separate platforms, but we do see you. And if we are unable to get to it on the air, we'll make sure that you get a direct answer. I do want to go to a Facebook question about whether or not there is legislation pending or legislative action available to raise teacher pay. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh wow! Right? Who? <laughs> no, um, I'll 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 start off, and, and 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 Senator Milton, I think he had legislation dealing with that. Um, yes, uh, we have been talking about teacher pay for a number of, of years. Uh, we just have to have the will to do it. Um, the former speaker talked about he had a teachers task force over the summer with individuals, and for the last eighteen months, we've been talking about teacher pay. Uh, there, there's been numerous pieces of legislation proposed, uh, but it just hasn't uh, matriculated and gotten leg, legs yet. Uh, so, and we do have the money uh, to, to uh, have teacher pay, to get teacher pay. We do have the dollars. Thank you. Yeah, we absolutely have the resources. When we look at what took place uh, about two sessions ago, when, um, you know, many teachers may have seen a slight bump in pay in, in certain parts of the state, but that was a temporary fix. And what I believe that Representative Porter is saying, Porter 100%, because we all support the legislation to do so, is that the state has to invest adequately in education. We look back in uh, Representative Porter, correct me if I'm wrong, what, 2008, 2009, $300 million was taken out of the education funding and it was never replaced. So we as a state have been catching up because of the rate of inflation in terms of how we spend our dollars towards education. On top of other policies they have contributed that take away from traditional public education as well. So we filed amendments in the Senate to address how we can strategically and be direct in, on raising teacher salaries across the entire state. So I think this is going to be a fight that we're going to continue to fight uh, more. And we just commend all the teachers that came down on Red for Ed Day, which was a phenomenal 
uh, day, but we just got to take it a step further and there has to be a commitment. We have another important question from Facebook and a lovely guest with Representative Summers, and I'm glad to see her. Um, and I hope Pam on Facebook will help me if I, I mischaracterize the question. Could someone speak to when we have a police officer who commits what appears to be race-based violence, racist violence, what makes it a hate crime and what doesn't? What is the line, especially when a police officer is involved? Taylor, you're on mute. Okay, now I'm not on mute. Well, let's understand hate crimes if you're talking about the federal statute, there's a list of people who are covered under the federal statute. But when it comes to the Indiana statute, unfortunately, because of the law we passed last year, if a police officer actually harms someone because of their race, it, it, the sentence that the officer can get is what is called an aggravator, okay? So that means, let's say it's bodily harm that carries a time period of a year to a year and a half in jail. They can then, the judge can aggravate that sentence and add more time. Now, what I want to go back to is what we did in the legislative session, which is why it's important for Indiana, for Hoosiers to know that the same penalty that a police officer would get for attacking someone based on their race is the same penalty they would get for attacking somebody because they're an IU basketball fan. It has nothing to do with your race, it's just any bias. So in my opinion, just my opinion, then nothing will happen because nobody can enforce the law because it applies to every bias. It's not just for you know, race, color, age, those, those words were taken out. It's any bias. So it could be a bias because you're wearing glasses. That could be a hate crime in Indiana. That's really helpful. Right. Yeah. Uh, something to add. No, I just wanted to make sure it, it's, it's actually pretty sad. Mm -hmm. It's pretty sad because uh, there are people who want to say we have a hate crime in Indiana, and uh, we don't. I'm just going to tell you, any lawyer you talk to will tell you that this law can never be enforced. I mean, how do you enforce a law when somebody's attacked because of their race, and you do the same thing when somebody's attacked because of who they affiliate with with sports? Doesn't make any sense. And that's why I think it will never, ever be charged in Indiana. It's a really good point. Uh, before I hand it back to Marshawn, we have another question that's come in uh, in lots of places about deprivatizing prisons in Indiana and companies that may be profiting from working inside prisons, but may not even hire those workers when they get out. Uh, so does anyone want to speak on the role of private entities in prisons in Indiana and what changes might be down the road? Let me say this. Let me respond to that question this way. I had a bill and I offered this last legislative session for criminal justice reform, a multi-year study for criminal justice reform. I wanted to look at from the time the police stops you, if the policeman makes the decision to take you to jail, what happens during that process, while you're in jail, what happens? When you go to court, what happens? If you're sentenced to DOC, what happens? And what happens after you're released? Our constitution of this great state says we will not use the Department of Correction for vindictive punishment. In my opinion, that's exactly what we do. We've tweaked our laws some, and tweaked it. But basically, we use the same criminal justice system that we used when Jesse James was robbing Crane, with one exception. Back then, everybody had a trial. I think the majority, upwards of 80% of the folks who are in prison now, did not do a trial. They did a plea bargain. And that, a lot, all far too often, is pressure time because back in the old day, they would put screws in your hands so you admitted to a crime or put 
folders on your chest and you admitted to a crime. So what happens now if you get arrested, then the public defender comes in and says, you can't go to trial for another five weeks. But if you will go ahead and plead guilty to this, it's a lesser charge, I can have you out of here by this afternoon. Mm -hmm. Well, you don't want to lose your job. Our criminal justice system is jacked all the way around, and that's the reason why uh, I offered that bill, to look at our criminal justice system and study it and have folk come in and testify, juveniles, young folk, people who have been locked up, people who have done time, and, and talk about this so we can fix it. It's almost too late now because of the, the, the climate of the country today. But we, there was a vision to do that prior to, but no one heard the cry. Thank you, Representative Bartlett. We're going to try to get through a few more of these questions. And so I'm actually going to combine uh, one of the questions, two of the questions that we got from Facebook. Uh, the question is, how can we expect equality from officers that don't want to even live in our community? And so that's an accountability. It's a you know a question about living in the community and officers. And then where is the accountability for township trustees when they're not helping people with rental and utility assistance? So these are uh, we got a question about making police officers live in the community, and then how do we deal with tr township trustees? Representative Pryor. Thank you. I think um, for uh, police living in our communities, um, I think that they should. And I'm not sure if Re Representative Hatcher is on here or not, but I think one of the bills that's in this packet would have required police officers to live in the community in which they serve. Uh, trustees are elected. And I think this is where it gets important for people to uh, to vote in people that is going to actually do the service in which they have sworn and taken oath for. So if they are, uh, if, if they're not supporting and giving out money to people in the community, then you have an op opportunity to vote them out. Um, so I think this is really important where your vote where your vote counts. But there is a piece of legislation that Representative Hatchett had, again, important piece of legislation that did not pass All right. and did not get a hearing. Did not get a hearing, okay. Uh, next, another question, can legislation be introduced to require officers to become licensed in order to maintain their jobs? Uh, that way their license can be revoked for misconduct and they cannot be rehired anywhere, anywhere else. Um, Marshawn, I, I, I would love to address that issue. I have been doing a tremendous amount of research in this area, and I just researched uh, the what is called peace officer licensing in the state of Missouri. And I am a tremendous supporter of licensing police officers. Um, one, there is blind accountability. As a licensed uh, attorney, if I do something and I get a complaint, it is reviewed in the dark as to who did it. It is reviewed by peers and they are independent. We don't even know who they are. The problem that you have in law enforcement in the state of Indiana is there are good law enforcement officers out there. What's good about them though, also causes a problem because loyalty as well as safety because they don't want to and cannot whistle blow on one of their colleagues, these bad officers continue to be on the force. With licensing, then these individuals would be responsible for their own individual license and therefore they would not be, deci it would not be decided whether or not they have their license by the police chief. It would be an independent panel and it clears up transparency because any lawyer that you want to look up whether or not they've ever had a complaint, you can do in the state of Indiana. Any doctor, whether or not they had a complaint, you can look up in the state of Indiana. Any architect, I could go down the line, nurses, any licensed individual, there's a database that shows whether or not they've been complained about. And 
let's put them on the same line as professionals. I, I support that wholeheartedly. Thank you very much. I'm going to turn it over to Molly so that we can continue to move through the questions. Sure, I have some kind of simpler procedural questions to make sure that everyone in the audience can stay engaged. On Facebook, we've been asked, where can I find all of these bills that you're talking about? Records of bills that are proposed and records of things that have passed. Representative Shackelford, would you like to, to point everyone to the right direction? Sure. The simplest way is to go to our um, House Democrat uh, website, our House website, and Senate website is iga.in.gov. That is also where you'll find the IBLC website, right after the House Dems website. But, and if you want to send us any ideas, you're looking through this legislation, make sure you send it directly to us at iblc at iga.in.gov. And if you need any help navigating the website, our staff is more than happy to help you navigate. I know I was online with a user, a young man that reached out to me on Facebook and I got to talk to him and actually help him navigate that website so he can see who authored what bills, when they authored them. So yeah, any assistance, please feel free to give our office a call. Thank you so much. Uh, we've had a follow-up question actually about the specific list of criminal justice reforms and where that might be available or when that might be available. So you can find that directly on our website on the Indiana Black Legislative Caucus. You can also find it on our Facebook and Twitter page. What we are planning to do is have a full legislative agenda probably about mid-July. Once our um, town halls wrap up June 25th, we want to put everybody inputs in there. Then we want to do some more research, look at best practices. So about the middle of July, you'll see a full legislative plan and you'll see us starting to submit our legislation. Legislation is not due until December and we go into session in January, but we want to get a head start and make sure we get all this legislation in. Thank you so much. One last issue-based question before I hand it back to Marshawn and Representative Shackelford. But before I do, I do want to point out that we are capturing all of the questions and comments verbatim. And we will make sure that everyone you see on screen receives those and we will reach back to you. If you feel like you haven't been addressed, you can also reach out to me, Molly Martin. That's M-A-R-T-I-N at newamerica.org. You can find that information also on the event page. But this last issue-based question is about minimum wage. What is in the works to raise minimum wage, to have a different conversation about what's a livable wage, and, and sometimes people use the phrase good and promising jobs. Where is that wage conversation? Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll start off, and I'm, I'm quite sure all my colleagues have something to say on this. Um, it's been a lot of discussion through Division of Workforce Development. Um, one thing that's going to be very interesting this upcoming session is about essential workers and those in, in individuals who worked in the grocery stores and were on the front line who made seven or eight dollars or maybe ten dollars an hour. Uh, they're essential. And so if they're essential, they need to make a livable wage, which a minimum it should be fifteen dollars. So uh, I, I think as, as we go through this, what we're going to ask the governor because he's talked about essential workers. What does that really mean to him? And, and I know what it means to us as, generally as a caucus. So I'm, I think this, you know, I know this upcoming session through Division of Workforce Development and next, uh, next Generation Jobs is gonna be an issue. Uh, Representative Pryor, then Jackson, and then we'll, I wanna jump in with some more questions. Um, I, I think um, it, the minimum wage is always going to be something that we're going to pursue as Democrats and as a Black caucus. Um, I will tell you one one thing, uh, one amendment that I had, uh, did not file it as a bill, but I did file it as an amendment, was to tie the minimum wage to the salaries of legislators. So whenever legislators receive a salary increase, the minimum wage would uh, would go up as well. Um, it was successful. Well, I did uh, offer up the amendment uh, and the Republicans uh, withheld the bill that I uh, tried to amend the 
uh, amendment in uh, because they did not want to have a vote on that particular amendment that I had. Uh, but I am going to continue to offer up that amendment because I feel as our salaries continue to increase, uh, people appearing our salaries, then the minimum wage should be increased as well. So I'm going to keep offering that. Uh, and it would have increased the minimum wage to about 15, a little bit over $15 an hour. I just want to kind of piggyback on that. Um, I've had a bill that would uh, increase the wages for women <laughs> because, as you know, women tend to make a lot less than what men do doing the same job. And no matter how many times you file that bill or any similar bills, getting it heard is the issue. I think if we were, would be able to get that bill heard, I think maybe we could get some headway. But if we're in the minority and when we don't get a bill heard, all we can do is put it on our wish list, so to speak, and keep filing them over and over again. And I think this, um, not this session, but the one before, I think we had a variation of increasing wages and minimum wage. I think we had somewhere about five, maybe five or six bills, and none of them got a hearing. Thank you for that. I'm actually going to modify the questions and actually, because they actually feel more like um, suggestions. Um, there's been a suggestion to get the Department of Education to create a chief diversity officer to make sure that there's a continuous focus on implicit bias in academic achievement gap. There's also been question, a concern about audits of the trustee's office. And there was also uh, a continued suggestion to continue to educate your Republican colleagues on the challenges uh, that uh, people of color, African Americans, Latinx, and Asian Americans and others uh, face. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Representative Robin Shackelford for the last word. Uh, thank you, Marshawn. And I just wanted to go do a couple of things in the closing. First, I want everyone to continue to advocate. We firmly believe that advocacy works. When we go into session January, we're going to need you down at the State House, whether if you're emailing, coming down to testify, or calling. It is a great way to get a lot of these bills that you want pushed and pushed through the legislature. Next, keep in touch with us. You can get in touch with us by our email address. You can get on our e-blast list. We send out e-blasts constantly every day of what's going on in the State House. We also are on social media. We keep that up to date. Representative Harris is our IT slash video guy. So we are constantly trying to keep you updated on what's going on in the state legislature. So feel free to keep in touch with us. Next, I wanna to talk to the young people. We have paid internships at the House and the Senate. These paid internships, they're starting to take applications now. Applications are due by October the 30th of this year. To be eligible, you have to be a sophomore college student, but we are excited if you do apply for these programs. We do hire one uh, intern to work specifically with the Black Caucus, and then we have other positions throughout the House and the Senate, whether it was fiscal, whether in your PR. So any of your interests, make sure you get that information on our internships. They pay $750 biweekly, a stipend. So it's not much, but the experience you gain will be great and you'll love it. I just wanna thank everyone for coming out. Thank our partners again for always supporting us and helping us out. The Indianapolis Recorder, New America, Indianapolis Urban League, IBE, IMHC, the NAACP, and Power, one of our new partners. So thank you, we couldn't do this without you. Last, make sure you tell your friends and family to join our second town hall, which is June 25th at 6.30 same place, same time. If they couldn't join this one and you know this information is valuable, make sure you reach out to them and give them that information. So thank you everyone for attending. Thanks everybody. Um, Indianapolis Recorder preparing um, for 125 years, preparing a conscious community. We've been with the Indiana Black Legislative Caucus and our partnership with New America. Um, Molly has something to say uh -huh. next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.